Hello, Karan. How are you? I'm very good. How's everything out in Germany? All good here. All good. Well, great. Uh, so it's it's been a little bit since we chatted, but um, yep. I'm glad we got to connect and, and record this review of the comparison I came up with. So I believe you have that document and you've read through it and uh, obviously you've seen the results and I hope you're as excited as I am uh, to see how, how great HubCell is doing with their early features and, and, and the uh, platform as it sits today against the competition. Oh, yeah. I'm actually very excited. And thank you so much for actually publishing a, a um, pretty in-depth analysis of all the different features. And I'm very happy to be able to elaborate on any of the questions or, or specific points that you want to get into. Well, great. I'm glad to hear it. And uh, again, I'm very thankful that you took the time. I wanted to record this to be uh, uh, a good supplement uh, or compliment to the article itself. Um, get your feedback on the ins and outs and the why and the how of cold emailing with respect to hubcell.com. And, uh, and we can review the article section by section mm -hmm. and, uh, and have some really good content to share with the readers um, if they choose to listen uh, versus read. And let's go okay. ahead and dig into it. And I'm also going to record a little bit of a screencast so that if they choose to, they can also view along with listen, along with read. And that's how we like to do things. So I'll go ahead and start that now. So um, I believe you have the cold email platform comparison PDF page pulled up. Yeah. So you're looking at the same thing I am. Great. Um, I am indeed. So let's start from the top. So um, I, I created this uh, along with a couple of my guys here at Right to Revenue. Uh, we started by compiling a very robust, large, whatever you want to call it, list of everyone that we have either heard recommended, uh, heard of, recommended using from colleagues, uh, used ourselves, uh, found through Quora or through Google search, everybody that represents themselves as a platform uh, ideal for cold emailing, right? Um, from there, uh, we uh, obviously do not want to review 36 platforms. Uh, there's no need. They're all used for different purposes. Uh, and I'll explain that in a little bit, but, um, what we wanted to whittle that down to is platforms that offer, uh, two things in particular, the, uh, ability to create cold email sequences, uh, and you'll go into the differences between sending a cold email and how that's structured in the platform versus a uh, newsletter blast or an opted in email. Um, and the second thing that we wanted to make sure each one of these final platforms we reviewed had is the uh, ability to pull down data, uh, emails, names, et cetera, from a database and or uh, order data ad hoc. Uh, and you'll explain where HubCell sits ad hoc versus database in a little bit uh, but that was the criteria so we whittled it down to five and the five that we have reviewed are autoclose.com and this is in order alphabetically no priority but autoclose uh, growbots.com growlabs.com found.ly i believe they're branded found and found obviously legal. Uh, on, on their website, they say okay. found is their oh. logo, but I, I honestly have no idea. Yeah. And then HubCell, uh, which you represent. And I invited you on the call today after I found through my research that HubCell offers something that um, is, is unique and, uh, in my opinion, uh, above the others. So I wanted to talk to you and get your feedback as to why and how and what of HubCell. So uh, why don't you go ahead and just quickly introduce HubCell and yourself and the team. Very good. Well, first of all, thank you very, very much for, for your nice words about HubCell. I'm, I'm very happy about having, having uh, uh, this review uh, and, and HubCell being shown as one of the better options in the list. Um, so again, thank you very much for that. Uh, the, just a high level pitch about what HubCell does. Uh, it automates the first half 
of B2B uh, sales automation. So basically it automates the first half of sales and uh, it takes over all of the steps from segmentation to data curation to data enrichment, uh, contact information validation, uh, as well as um, reaching out to those people in a highly structured, uh, customized and intelligent way. And then of course, of course, tracking uh, uh, the conversion of people and then allowing the user to see based on different variables attached to the prospects and the companies, how that conversion differed for one bucket versus another bucket and uh, closing the entire loop from uh, um, engagement all the way to uh, analyzing the data and then resegmenting or iterating on your segments and basically keep going through this cycle. This is the core of the product uh, that we offer. Um, so that would, that would be my answer to the first question. Uh, we are based out of Berlin. Uh, we, we founded the company about two and a half years ago. It started out as a side project um, after I had used, well, in my previous job, I had used a bunch of the existing softwares. Some of them actually are on this list. I won't be mentioning any, uh, but some of them are on this list and we use them. And I was always able to find something that I was personally missing uh, in, in supporting uh, my team uh, back in the previous company that I was working at. And uh, uh, what we did then was we started working at it uh, in-house, but in a very, very structured way. Uh, that was successful. Uh, then what I did was I basically put the concept online and I tried to uh, uh, find a, a, a CTO to uh, co-found it with me as well as develop the software which I did luckily. And uh, as soon as we had uh, uh, um, uh, done a private beta um, and found out that there was demand for our software, we uh, uh, founded the company and we uh, started working on that. Uh, two and a half years later, we had 23 people um, and we are now entering the US market as well as uh, keeping our, our share of the European market also in the post GDPR uh, environment. So that would be then in a nutshell where we are. Very good. Very good. Okay. Um, well, thank you for that synopsis. And um, Berlin, being in Berlin in particular, I mean, I think we should touch on this. Um, we don't have to dive into GDPR. Um, I'd like to invite you to record uh, another segment specific to GDPR uh, on a later day. So we don't have to dive in uh, in detail, but why don't you give me just the uh, the status of the union, so to speak, with regards to having developed this platform out of a country like Germany versus um, the U.S. So um, Germany has had and still has probably the most stringent data protection laws in the world, right? And they don't really differentiate that much between B2C versus B2B. So from the get-go, we really needed to minimize the risks of um, doing outbound uh, B2B, which is essentially an inherently cold outreach, um, to be able to make our customers, um, let's say, at least have some peace of mind that they are not all the way into the black but rather on, on, a, on the white side of the gray area, right? So from the, from the very start, we needed to develop a software that was gathering data in a way that is compliant to GDPR. So in theory, it, it should be compliant to GDPR. And we already started developing it about two and a half years ago. So back then, GDPR was still in its early stages. It has been gaining a lot more attention as well as its interpretation has been developed much more. Uh, and we find ourselves in the position where we can say, yes, we, our data gathering is fully GDPR compliant. And we follow a lot of the rules uh, um, that, that, that dictate the, the data collection as well as data retention of GDPR. Yeah? So being mm -hmm. in Germany pushed us more to, to, um, to be legally compliant to GDPR, um, even more so le uh, being legally compliant to the German way of uh, uh, outbound. Yeah, so that, 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 in, that in itself was a, a challenge big enough. 
Yeah. Um, the the other thing, of course, is the being a, con a company in Europe. Um, our very existence uh, um, as as a business relies on that we don't break the laws of the countries that us that are hosting us. Uh, you can definitely have a company in, in, in the U.S., which we actually do. We have a, a New York-based entity now. Um, but um, if you're based out of the U.S., you don't necessarily need to be uh, uh, GDPR compliant as long as you're not targeting European citizens. Uh, but as a European company, we need to be GDPR compliant from scratch, from, from the get-go. Understood. Okay. And like I said, we'll dive into GDPR, but um, it's good to understand just the history and more or less the culture that the company was developed under, you know, a company uh, based out of the U.S. Uh, that was developed under U.S. regulations, um, has that sort of culture in its bones. And, um, and I like the idea and the fact that you guys are um, you know, developing your culture based on what you're used to and developing the product based on what restrictions and regulations uh, you have uh, run other businesses and run this business under. Um, that to me is a great start. Um, so I think that that actually works in your favor, although it's probably difficult um, and it has been difficult. I think it works in your favor. Uh, and uh, the results are uh, are here. So let's go ahead and uh, dive into that. And I'll, I'll recap really quickly with uh, the five email platforms, AutoClose, Foundly, GrowBots, GrowLabs, and HubCell. The reason why we have these five is because all five have one thing in common. They all allow you to both structure and send uh, cold email campaigns through your personal inbox. Uh, and those are sequences, not just a blast. And they also allow you to uh, pull down data and or order data from within the dashboard. So let's go ahead and open up the chart and I'll make sure that uh, it looks great on the video. So uh, if you zoom out to 400%, if you are looking at what I'm looking at, 300 or 400%, you should be able to see clearly each uh, row and the text in there. If you keep it at 100%, it's a little blurry, but zoom out to 300%, it looks good. Um, so the data sources. All right, so we talked about uh, ad hoc versus a database. Um, in this review, uh, during the demos, and also I have used personally four of these platforms, Foundly, GrowBots, GrowLabs, and HubCell. Uh, Foundly, uh, I only used their Chrome extension for a period of time. Grobots, I ran, um, I don't know, close to 8,000 emails through Grobots. Um, Grow Labs, um, 10 plus thousand emails through Grow Labs, a little more experience there. Um, and uh, HubCell, uh, obviously, you and I have been through the demo, and uh, we have started a couple of sequences in the last few days through HubCell, so I'm getting the data back from those and uh, uh, very, very promising results so far. Um, so the data sources, uh, ad hoc versus the database. Uh, can you give us the brief uh, understanding of the benefits of ad hoc versus uh, a freelancer or in-house team continually compiled database of contacts? What are the benefits of ad hoc? All right. So when you are um, using a platform like Foundly or let's say HubCell and you are um, ordering data, which is curated for you ad hoc, uh, one of the benefits that you have versus having an in-house team or hiring a freelancer via Upwork or freelancer.com, uh, you know, in, in any of the, the Asian countries, this is most popular anyway, uh, is the, 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 uh, let's say the uniformity of your quality. Um, when you are using a software, which where the most of the, the process of structuring, enriching, validating, and quality uh, uh, controlling that data is preset, uh, all, of the, all of the pieces, and with pieces I mean all the different people that are actually working on that data, uh, will be limited in the amount of mistakes they can make. So that would be one of the benefits of having ad hoc or curated data uh, uh, through a platform, yeah? 
obviously a freelancer provides you ad hoc data as well. But the quality of freelancer one may be totally different uh, than, than you know, free, freelance number two. Uh, uh, because they may have different skill levels and they may have different ways of doing um, research, data research. But if you're mm-hmm. using a, a software or a platform which actually has a backend where all of that research pours into and then structures itself and the variable creation is faced to the same basic requirements for every prospect, then you get uniform quality across the, the data set that you have. And not just across one data set, but, but across all data sets that you pull from that particular um, platform. And HubCell is such a platform where we have a, a, a proprietary software, which is used to, to gather the data, structure it, and then enrich it, um, and provide up to 20, 25 different variables uh, relating to the, the prospect as well as the company. And a lot of these prospect and company variables are uh, categorical uh, data, which is another thing um, it, you can do better once you have the structure in place. Otherwise, you would need to onboard or train every freelancer that you want uh, uh, the method on how to create these variables. Just to give a brief example, uh, seniority is created in HubCell by looking at the, the, the part of the title that describes their seniority. Director of business development will have seniority director and department business development. And uh, um, this, these two parts being divided no longer being in a continuous string, which a name or a company name and a title is, it's a continuous string, um, as opposed to categorical data, which is seniorities, let's say CXO to VP to director to senior to manager to XYZ, and then a department uh, ranging from sales, business development, general management, information technology, architecture, and so forth and so on, combined together the title. And this categorical data can actually be used as a, as a criteria in a much more reliable way than, than a string. I can talk about it for a very long time, but for the sake of brevity. Well, that was a great synopsis. Um, so I want to touch on one thing, uh, one aspect of the chart here. Uh, while uh, demoing these platforms, I mean, we did this at a time in a very unique time when GDPR had been passed, I believe, May 25th. Yeah. Um, and, and all of these demos happened uh, either right around that time or shortly after. Um, and w- currently, as it sits, I believe, as of two weeks ago, um, and this is being recorded uh, on, I believe it's June uh, 18th, um, uh, these other platforms are not prospecting in the EU uh, until further notice. Um, and I can update this chart in a week from now and see if that is still the case. Um, so, so that's very important to understand. So, um, we'll move on past data, uh, into outreach, um, outreach as a section, this touches on, uh, how the platform sends the emails, whether that's through an ESP, uh, SMTP out, or is it through the, uh, the user's client, the user's server, Gmail, Outlook, et cetera. Um, it also touches on, um, what types of emails the system is allowed to send to uh, that revolves around the data uh, and whether or not you can upload data that includes an info at email as an example or sales at email and whether or not that platform will allow you to send it. Um, it also touches on the functionality of A-B testing and uh, how dynamic and customizable the copy within the email editor can become, which is very important. As we all know, with cold emailing, especially, uh, you need to customize that message as, as much as possible to the end receiver. And that requires dynamic text, dynamic placeholders, um, things like if then statements, which in all honesty, uh, I have used before, but I have never used in a cold email campaign. Uh, until learning about HubCell, uh, which was very exciting. So why don't you start with explaining um, the 
reason you want to send through your Gmail or Outlook client for cold emails, just uh, give us the three sentence or so reason for that. The reason why um, we advocate that the email should go from the outbox of the, uh, the user um, is the sent email carries the information of from where the email was sent. If you're sending this email from a third party server, it will be signed by your email on, and sent on your behalf, but the actual send the, uh, uh, sender would be the third party server. Oftentimes, these emails are automatically guessed as um, spam emails. So that you have a higher chance of getting into the spam folder if you're sending it from the third party server. Typically, you use third party server for a very high volume of, of emails, such as an email blast or a newsletter, where all the emails are going at the very same time, not uh, uh, simulating a human like sending. In B2B sales, however, the use case is different. What you want is to create an impression that this email was written and sent by a human being to a human being. And that can only be done if all the other spell breaking, uh, uh, let's say things such as sending from a third party server or, or uh, having a very generic copy or sending to, let's say, uh, emails that are not properly guessed, all of these things will break that, that, that spell. And this has been one of our uh, main reason actually why we wanted to always send emails from the outbox of the user. Got it. Uh, and that was more like three paragraphs, but <laughs> you explained it very well, and I'm glad right. you did because I don't think three sentences would have would have answered the question sure. uh, uh, as much as we we probably needed to. So thank you for that. So sure. um, I guess the uh, non contenders in this category foundly found. Yeah. Um, they're only integrated with G Suite at the time of this review, but the others are all integrated uh, with both Microsoft and Google uh, as far as being able to send through and connect with. Um, so those are all uh, tied, which you see in yellow on the sheet. Um, now, a couple categories where HubCell did win out. Um, first one, how dynamic can your users make the copy? I'll go ahead and touch on that for you. Um, that is... A uh, couple of aspects that are pretty typical when we say static and custom placeholder uh, for the others. That is your typical insert name here, insert company name, insert title, uh, X, Y, Z. Uh, when you get to the next level of dynamic placeholder text, uh, that's where you can create custom fields uh, for your data set. Um, I'm trying to think of the example that I had the other day where I believe I went and um, added a, um, a certain sentence, a certain statement um, that can be dynamically inserted uh, based on what that prospect was currently um, advocating via their LinkedIn profile at the time. And this related to uh, what type of uh, business they were in and what type of marketing agenda they had at that time. And that was a manual process. I had to build the sheet out. But what's great is once the data set is built out and the row is there, or sorry, the field in the row is there, um, I can use HubCell to go ahead and insert that into the email copy. And then the big one that I mentioned um, a couple minutes ago is the if-then statements. So when you have a large data set and you are scraping or compiling both, um, let's just say, heads of finance and heads of product, or heads of finance and the CEO. Uh, instead of creating multiple campaigns and running those separately, um, HubCell gives you the ability to add an if-then statement with custom copy related to each uh, data uh, point or each uh, categorical uh, data field, which in this example is if they are in the finance department, send this copy. If they are the CEO, president, owner, founder, et cetera, send this copy. And that allows you to create one campaign uh, to send to the entire data set. And you know that the email copy is written for that persona and you do not have to worry about much else, uh, which is uh, very, very intuitive, very convenient. And um, the results are obviously higher 
click rates, higher reply rates, more customization um, stems from that. So uh, the next thing that we see a, a, a nice green box for HubSell, uh, can the user create if then uh, that we actually just mentioned. Uh, let's go to A-B tests, um, pretty much the same. Um, Multi-channel messaging, uh, we can touch on at the very end. Uh, let's just see if there's anything worth talking about. I think we mentioned the being able to send info at, sales at, and help at that relates to uploading your data. Uh, some of these platforms do not allow you to send to those types of email boxes so that they can keep their bounce rates on average high. But sometimes you do want to send to those email inboxes, uh, and that's up to the user. Um, uh, let me just... Uh, if you'd like, I can I can share a little bit more on the uh, the the reason why we even developed the dynamic placeholders and how that actually fits fit into us us being a German company. Actually, why don't you go through the last section here and maybe pick out the points that you think are worth discussing with re regards to GDPR and what's happening now? All right. So one of the core. Um, so when we speak about GDPR, we are mainly limiting the conversation to the B2B uh, data gathering and outreach. Um, in, in GDPR, when a company or, or a, a, a data controller collects data about a data subject, in our conversation that's prospect, there needs to be a predefined legitimate reason why they're gathering that data. So I don't know exactly how that fits with, uh, and I can't make a formal uh, um, 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 statement about that, but it seems to me that the uh, pre-existing databases um, cannot fulfill that criteria because that data is gathered before the interest or let's say the purpose of gathering that data was defined. Uh, if, if you can, if you can understand, you know, if I'm being clear with that. So basically, mm -hmm. only ad hoc research data can be compliant uh, in most of the European countries as part of the GDPR. So that's very yes. important, right? The other thing mm -hmm. is uh, that the, the, uh, the data that you generate needs to be properly protected. It needs to be properly, uh, so if you're storing it on a particular server, th that server needs to be um, uh, properly encrypted. And also people that are processing your data. Now let's say you have, uh, uh, you hire an ad hoc uh, data research team or um, there is part of your data processing where somebody is working on improving it, or part of the uh, you know data processing. An example here would be you get a reply from your from your prospect, and that reply has been viewed, and sentiment has been provided to that. Um, if it's done fully automatically, who has access to it? If if there is a QC aspect, who is it? Are all the people involved in the entire chain under NDAs? So that's very important uh, in, in, um, in the, uh, as well as signing data process, processing agreements. So these two parts are also very, very important. Having the non-disclosure agreement set as well as data processing agreement set with your suppliers uh, is very, very mm -hmm. important. Uh, the other thing is, uh, let's say you are providing data about European citizens. Uh, this data is research ad hoc and uh, um, uh, your customers can legally um, do outbound. And, and this could be either via uh, email or other channels, depending on the local laws of the countries. Uh, I'll get to that in a bit if we have time. But uh, the main thing there needs to be, is that data uh, easily removable? So can the, the data subject, which again is the prospect, easily have the data changed, erased, or unsubscribed to, and is that tracked uh, uh, well? That is one of the uh, requirements of the GDP. Thirdly, data portability, uh, which is in, in this particular list um, uh, uh, written as whether or not the EU data subject data is kept in, uh, uh, in an EU-based server, um, which is important in the GDPR. You can't um, decide to move that data outside of Europe because as long as it stays in Europe, those servers have to, uh, have to uh, um, you know, uh, follow certain strict regulation. And 
you cannot really take the European data without the permission of the prospect, which in this case is actually cold. So you don't have the permission and move it to uh, outside of Europe. Yeah. And lastly, you definitely need somebody to help you navigate the GDPR. It's very, very complicated. Uh, a lot of that is still uh, under interpretation. There hasn't been any any uh, uh, very serious breaches that would have made uh, the the news and and uh, uh, you know judges making rulings and so forth. So there is a lot of evolution that's still left to be had by GDPR, as well as the e-privacy uh, uh, regulation that is still under uh, uh, under um, uh, commenting from the European Council as well as the European Parliament. So there is a lot more we can talk about about the GDPR, but I see that we're already over uh, the uh, prescribed time. Mm -hmm. Yes, and uh, you, you mentioned everything uh, except for one last point, and this is where the marketers will have their ears perk up and we can get into this when we talk about GDPR and the ways to make sure you stay compliant when you do cold outreach, but it, it revolves around um, other options besides email and yeah. integrating those options into your outbound sequencing, whether it's through one dashboard or through multiple, but making sure that you remain compliant uh, with the initial touch points with the data uh, as it sits in your dashboard uh, and making sure that um, you are comfortable and the company as it as a whole is protected um, from any potential issues. Uh, so we'll get into that when we talk about GDPR specifically. I uh, just wanted to recap here and mention the final thoughts with regards to uh, data quality, copy customization. Um, customer success is not something we talked about, but I will commend your customer support and customer success uh, with regards to my personal account and uh, those that I, I, I did hear reviews from. Um, that is a very, very high level um, point to make sure that HubSell is mentioned in. You guys have great customer success. Um, so data quality, uh, ad hoc delivery of custom orders. So if I wanted uh, this audience in this geographic region uh, at this company size, uh, you would be able to deliver that. Um, I believe we did one and, and the delivery was 48 hours and the, uh, the total quality of the data and the accuracy of the data was, was something that I was blown away by. I've used other uh, pull down filter methods and dashboards and received all sorts of data from, uh, you know, different titles and different industries. And it was a, a very, very difficult job to just make sure to filter, refilter that data manually and go through each one and make sure it's, it fits. But with ad hoc data delivery, um, my experience working with you guys so far, that was not a major concern. Um, copy customization, we mentioned the use of dynamic text. You want to customize these messages as much as possible. So uh, using if then statements and using uh, customized dynamic fields uh, that are above and beyond the standard really set your cold messages apart. Uh, customer success, which we mentioned, your team has been great during the onboarding process, so I commend you there. Uh, GDPR compliance, which is the big buzzword right now, and um, we have confirmed full GDPR compliance, and being out of Germany, uh, this puts you in a different position and a much more um, closely uh, adherent, so to speak, position uh, with regards to GDPR and um, and I believe you won out in that category. So um, congrats on, on the uh, winning this uh, review from my team. Um, hopefully, you know, it leads to bigger things for you guys and gives you some good feedback uh, from an objective standpoint, and you can use it going forward. And then, Karan, I'd like to invite you back to do a GDPR review, and we'll talk about days and times and stuff uh, offline, and, uh, and we'll chat soon. Thank you very much. Alex and I very much enjoyed reading the uh, the, uh, the the review and also the downsides that you mentioned. We we'll, we are definitely working on that as well. So anyway, thank you very much and happy to continue our conversation another time. All right, Kron, you have a good night.